Thank you, worship team and Katrina, thank you. It, it hardly seems possible that it's been 25 years, but then this morning somebody started putting in Facebook pictures of 25 years ago, and we saw our hairstyles and our shoulder pads, the bands back really, really fast. I have to tell you, I think that the other pastors have expressed some of this as well, that um, for us, when Paul and I think about our good old days, when we think about, when we start reminiscing about life and, and when it was wonderful, new hope always comes to mind. Often when I preach on themes of needing faith or when I, I, I want illustrations, I'm looking for illustrations of, of people who took huge steps of faith and, and then God rewarded in some way. When, when I talk about prayer and answers to prayer, new hope comes to mind. And I often tell new hope stories. When I came here, when I was assigned to start this church, I was so burned out when I was first approached to do this. I was so burned out that I said, absolutely not. I, I can't. I, I can't possibly do this. I had tried to plant a, a church in New York City, and it, it hadn't really worked, and, and I was so burned out. And then I went to a conference. It was, some of you might, Larry, you will know about this, Ministers Institute of the Northeast. So it's for ministers, right? And the minister who comes from some other country, and I'm not going to say anything else so that you won't know who that minister was, starts by saying, in the next three days, I'm going to talk about the man of God. And from then on, he started using the most sexist language that I had heard from a pulpit in a long, long time. And you know, in the midst of that, it didn't make sense. But in the midst of that, language that excluded me, somehow God cut, cut through all of that and called me and spoke to me. And in that place, that day, I said yes to God. I said, God, I will plant that church. If you will go with me, and if you will show us what needs to happen, we'll do it. God, we'll do it. You and I, and whoever else will come. Because at that point, it was just Jesus, Paul, and I. <laughs> So right after we said yes to God to plant this church, we started praying for a team. And, and then, you know, the, the things that God does, seemingly out of nowhere, but following a nudge from God, I met Brad and Eileen Button and Wes and Jennifer Becker, except that they were not married yet. And I can tell you a couple of stories about, about both of them before they were married and, and the commitments that they made to the Lord Jesus Christ and to, to mobilize him, who, whoever it took and whatever it took, so that the people, the unchurched people from Rochester could hear about the Lord Jesus Christ. And as a team, we started to think, you know what I meant, why that mission statement is so long? Because it was put together by a committee. <laughs> <laughs> we thought big. We, we knew that God had called us to do this, and we didn't set out to plant a church. We set out to start a movement of churches that planted churches that reached people that had given up a church. You know, I think that we were a bit unhealthy. I think that we had a holy obsession. We, we, we had this thing, we had a, a, a fire burning in our belly that we had to do whatever it took so that unchurched people and people who had given up a church would would have an opportunity in this place to meet the Lord. Actually, we had an obsession with our zip code. Like we, we would walk the streets of this zip code. We would, you know, we would, we would pray. We assigned each other streets that we would pray for. My street, street was Linden Street. And I tell you, I walked up and down that street and I Pray for those folks so many times. And so when, when people from that street will come here, I knew that they may have thought they were coming here for the music, which was awesome, but they were really coming here because all these people were praying for the zip code and praying that people will come to Jesus. So that story about the 60,000 hand address envelopes, this is what happened. We knew that within a whatever 
radios we had determined, there were 20,000 people that lived here. Um, and so we, we got their names. And we thought, let's send every person an invitation to come to the grand opening at New Hope. But let's send it in a hand-addressed envelope so that they will think it's something from a family member. Now, that dates us as much as the hair and the big shoulder pads because, you know, the idea that someone will hand-address envelopes. And people said, you never get help for 20,000 envelopes. You, you never get enough people to do that. But there were so many people who offered that we ended up sending to the same 20,000 people, we ended up sending three invitations to come to the opening. It was great. <laughs> we, we just dreamt big. What if, you know, we just wanted to make sure that we did our part for what we knew God was going to be doing. So the first service, we thought, okay, 20,000 invitations. Let's say that 1% shows up. Let's plan refreshments for 200 people. That's the math, right? Yeah, okay. Um, so we plan refreshments and we and we pray for two two hundred people. And, and I leave but was in charge of the refreshments for two hundred people. We had hundred and ninety nine people who came to the very first service. Wow. One person was not obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> You know, uh, two days ago, Paul and I were in Miami, and we got a Facebook message from someone whose name I don't remember either, who said, I was there on that first service, and I gave my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what has happened in my life since. Pretty amazing. You know, I remember saying to the team afterwards when we got there the week after, I said, wasn't it unbelievable? And Wes Becker said, woman of little faith, oh. we pray for this. Why do you say it was unbelievable? <laughs> Just about everything about New Hope was out of the box, was outside of the box. We thought a lot about why we do what we do. And we would ask the question over and over again. If the goal is to reach unchurched people in Rochester, will doing this achieve that? And if not, why are we doing it? And over and over again, we will call each other and to stop to let's stop doing that if it is not leading us to reaching unchurched people in the city of Rochester. And so to reach the unchurched people, we, we did all kinds of things. I tell you, I will never, Sherry, I will never remove, forget that day when you came here and did the first liturgical dance that I had seen. Now everybody's doing liturgical dances. But back then, you, you danced in here with candles in your hands. We saw a picture today. My first concern was, there is going to be a fire. <laughs> <laughs> because we had had a little bit of experience there. But we had, had to put out a fire that we were sitting inside the night. And we had to bring out a fire. So I remember that. But I remember when Sherry danced. And that sort of opened the floodgates for other very creative things. I remember that there were parts of me that worshiped God through that dance that I didn't even know I had. There were feelings of worship that, that arose inside of me when I watched the dance, when I watched people worshiping God like that. It was pretty amazing. We had cutting edge music. If you were here then, you, you, you need to understand, we had musicians with blue hair who were leading people in worship here. I'm not making this up. Actually, that was when we graduated to the blue hair because at the very beginning there was a time when somebody had blue hair and blonde hair. And Paul was wearing his shirt and tie. And somebody else was wearing something else. But we had planned it like that so that when people came, they could see a variety, a diversity of stars appear, not just in the music, but in the way people look like. It, I am astonished that the neighbors never complained about the sound in this place. Because I tell you, when Don Porterfield cracked up the music, it was loud. I mean, the music was loud, the, the sound was loud, but, but it was more than just loud. 
there was here a, an energy of the Spirit of God that made this place vibrate, pulsate, with excitement, with, with people's voices, as we were reaching out to God and worshiping God with all our hearts, with all our voices. I remember Valentine's services. I think we were the only church in the city that offered Valentine's services for people who, who wanted the love of God, but we didn't say that exactly up front. We, we invited people to come for a Valentine's service, and people came. We had more people attend Valentine's services in this church than we did Easter Sunday. Because on Easter, people would go visit their families, and on Valentine's, you know, you came to church, you came to New York. <laughs> the preaching was all in series, and it was all about uh, people uh, being drawn. It was biblical teaching for people who normally were not attracted to church. And the purpose was to, to talk on, on topics that were of interest to people. And I remember Gary one day said to me, Delia, it doesn't matter where you start. With you, the punchline is always Jesus. You better believe it. The punchline for everything that we did here was always Jesus. And one of our, another holy obsession for us was that this church would never become an institution. That this church would be, would be always a place with a lot of freedom, with a lot of space for people to encounter Jesus wherever it was that they were in their, in their journey. I think that several of the pastors mentioned the testimonies. It, um, they took quite a bit of work at the beginning. It was not normal for people to give those testimonies in front of, of the congregation. And so we would sit down with folks and ask them to tell us their story. And we would write out the story that they told us and then edit it. And, and then people would stand here and they would read their own story to the congregation. And sitting behind them, I could see their legs like this, the nervousness for the first time, some of them standing up there sharing about their journey with Jesus. We were, we were intentionally a church for people who could not imagine themselves in church. And so we did things on purpose to, to attract them, to create a place for them here. We poured over maps. We studied demographics. We wanted to find, we, we wanted God to bring them, but we also wanted to find those people who, who were not going anywhere, who were not in relationship with Jesus. And when they came, it was very important to us not to be churchy and not to be preachy. And that's why we met in this place, in this beautiful place. It still looks like the old German house auditorium and smells like the old German house auditorium. <laughs> and I am thrilled that we actually got heat tonight in yeah. the German house yeah. auditorium. <laughs> we called ourselves a church, but we were more, more like a community of believers intent in creating space for people to come to know Jesus on their own terms. And now when I think about it, it seems so crazy to me that people would come to Jesus on their own terms. I mean, Jesus deserves that we come to him on his terms, but we wanted so much to, to, to be that community of believers to encourage others to find Jesus here. And, and God was so gracious to us. God was so gracious to us. And many people found Jesus in this place. Actually, the first year, we had those prayer cards, and we used to ask people, if you have given your life to Christ today, mark an X in the back, or write us a note about it. And on the first year, people who actually wrote that in their prayer card, there were over 200 people who did that in the first 12 months of the life of, of New Hope. It, it was amazing. It was, it was like living a ministry dream to plant a New Hope Church and to see God at work, and to see life ch lives changed. We, um, we realized very early on that if we didn't have a decentralized ministry that we would be in trouble. 
that here everybody had to had to lead in some way, that we needed everybody's gifts, that everybody had a gift, and we, we had to help people develop their gifts, and that together we were going to become what, what God had put in our hearts to become. And so one of the things that we knew early on was that small groups had to be fundamental. And that, and that everybody needed to find a small group where they could belong, that, that a small group was going to be a, a place where people could get to know others and could be known, thoroughly known as well. And every small group had to have a dominant theme. So they, we, we would talk to small group leaders you need to know what your small group is about. So on Sunday, you can invite people to come to a group that does, that does this, something very specific. So I would ask small group leaders, what's the common denominator of the small group? And um, there were two guys whose names I'm not going to, to give you today that had broken up with their girlfriends. <laughs> and they said, Okay, our common denominator in our small group is that we hate women. <laughs> <laughs> and both, both are now happily married. Actually, I'm in touch with both of them. But they would invite other men who would sort of be in the fringes of New Hope to come. Men who were, let's say, in between relationships, <laughs> and they were at that place of hating women, <laughs> and they would invite people to meet Jesus in a small group of men who hated women. <laughs> and you know, one of them said, actually, one of them was in Miami not that long ago, and we had dinner with him, and he said, quote, the women haters small group at New Hope helped me get healthy so that I could marry healthy. How cool is that? Both of those guys have married healthy. During those early years, I saw my role as ministering to the small group leaders. And they were at the front end of pastoral ministry. Actually, every small group leader, we, we talk to them, to you, and we said, you are the pastors of this church. And we, we, I, I hope that we empower you to, to do that to the people in your small groups. And so when someone called the church and they needed pastoral care, we would refer them to their small group. Not to the small group leader, but to the small group. And, and the small group did that caring, that pastoral care that is so important in the life of the church. But what was amazing to me was that there were new people coming to believe in Jesus for the first time. And relatively soon after that, they were involved in the life of a small group and they were pastoring other newer believers who were coming to faith in Christ. Wes Becker, it was unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> now, I have to tell you, at New Hope Church, we had the world's best welcome mat ministry. Now, that was led by Brad Button, who was a relatively new believer, and he wanted everybody in this city to meet this Christ that was changing his life. He and Eileen had met each other and Christ at Roberts, and Brad wanted to make sure that everyone who came here felt loved and welcomed even before they walked into the German House Auditorium. We were the first church I ever heard of that had parking lot attendance. It was so cool. The reason was, we didn't have enough spaces here for parking. And we had to park in some other places that Wes Becker found. And so that people would not think it was awful that they had to walk all these freezing blocks to come to church. Brad and Wes came up with the idea of having parking lot attendants who froze in the parking lots, <laughs> welcoming people to come here where they could meet Jesus. You know, the other side of it is that there were people who couldn't sing. There were other people who couldn't preach, who couldn't lead small groups, but they could be parking lot attendants. And during that time, yes, everyone was a minister. 
Everyone who came here, we tried to mobilize them to minister in the name of Jesus. Now, before any other church in America was doing this, New Hope was serving coffee because I leave button was the coffee expert here in this town. It wasn't just any coffee, it was Sumatra. It had to be good coffee that we served here. And she taught me into letting people bring coffee to church. Mind you, the coffee was being served there. And I had a difficult time thinking that people would sit in church worshiping Jesus with one hand up and the other one drinking <laughs> coffee. But I really thought it was important, and you know it was important. And we did it. And, and there were a number of other things that we did that we all had to stretch to do it because the goal was to lead people to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we all had to bend and we all had to grow to, to do our part in, in making that happen. Probably one of the things that I remember the most about that time as a leader was something that Bishop Bates taught me. Um, Paul and I were blessed that Larry Reno and Bishop Bates and Paul were all sharing an office suite, so that gave me access to this incredible wise man who had led the church in Africa for many years, do, doing in Africa what I now do in Latin America. And, and Bishop Bates has said to me, Delia, when you start this church, do not let anyone in the church ever think that the Great Commission is up for a vote. The Great Commission is never up for a vote. You know, the Great Commission, go and make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, teach them to obey everything I have commanded you, and I will be with you always to the end of the and one of the blessings that I remember was putting that into practice. And going to what we used to call the administrative council, I don't know what it's called now, other churches call it the board, we call it the administrative council. I'm going to the council and saying, we need to be doing such and such a thing. And the people in the administrative council saying to me, Pastor Delia, you are the pastor of this church, you lead this church, we expect you to hear from God. You lead us, and our role as an administrative council is to create the systems and to make that happen. Don't give us the opportunity to vote on the Great Commission. And you know, that has shaped me. That has shaped me. The Great Commission is never up for a vote. And today, that is one of the things that shapes my ministry in Latin America. Several have already told stories about how New Hope was about more than this, what happened here. I want to tell you another one. There was a woman who met me back there one day. Her name is Anna. She and I are now Facebook friends. And this is the story that she tells me. I don't remember it. But she tells me that she used to come with the students from the University of Rochester that would come here. What, 20 students were coming from their doctoral programs? No, they're, they're school of business, right? No. They were grad students at the University of Rochester, and we were running a bus for a while to bring them here so that they could find a, a family of Christ here, and one of them was Sharon Nash. And Sharon Nash had invited Anna to come to church. I've never met her before. Anna said to me on that day, I'm from Finland, and I have arrived late every Sunday, so I wouldn't have to talk with anybody, and I tried to leave soon after the service finished. But I just want you to know, tomorrow I'm, I'm finished my school, tomorrow I'm going back to Finland, and I just want to say thank you. And I said to her, Anna, have you given your life to Jesus? And she said, no, and I don't know where I stand there. And she said that I gave her my Bible. And I said, please read this book and let it speak to you. Do you know I thought someone had stolen that Bible? <laughs> <laughs> it was a Bible that someone had given to my father-in-law who had given it to me, and one day the Bible was gone, and I thought someone had stolen that Bible. It was my study 
Bible, but apparently Anna took it and following the arrows and the underlining and all of that, she read it and following the voice of Jesus in the Word of God, Anna found Jesus and gave her life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And she started a ministry. And her ministry has aided over 1,000 widows in Africa who are now empowered to minister to other people in Africa. And Anna says to me as my best friend now through Facebook, she says, I gave my life to Jesus because of what I heard and the hope and reading the word of God. It's amazing. It's unbelievable, Wes Becker. <laughs> <laughs> this is our legacy, folks. We were a different church. We set out to be different and fresh and original and inventive and creative and deeply spiritual. A church willing to do whatever it took to lead people to Christ. And then we watch in awe as God answered, and as God answered prayer and responded to what he wanted to do here in New Hope and in Rochester. I, the last thing I want to share with you is this. My prayer life was transformed by this church. Because every Sunday we ask you to write your prayer requests, and you wrote them. And every Sunday night, we would meet together in a room way up there. I don't think we ever had more than 10 people, but we would, we would just shuffle the prayer cards and distribute them. And each one of us would get quite a few prayer cards. And then we would kneel and we would pray for all the requests that were in those prayer cards. And it wasn't flashy, it wasn't loud, it was one-on-one, -on -one. it was one person kneeling next to, next to another person, praying for card after card after card. But then coming to church on Sunday and hearing how God had answered prayer and the things that what God was doing in the lives of people that we knew were directly related to the things that were written in the prayer cards that we had prayed about the day before. Simple faith of simple people simply coming before the Lord, asking week after week to answer prayer on behalf of new hopers, and then watching in awe what God did in response to those prayers. That was the original heartbeat. And even today, 25 years later, as I remember and as I reminisce, I realize that I am a better person for having been a new hoper 25 years ago. God bless you, and to God's good work.